Redford City for a while. It's all your fault. Look at all these awesome people here. This is fantastic. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. So we had a, this is our first time up to Sacramento, and you guys came out in droves, and I tell you how much I really appreciate it. It's fantastic. It makes me feel unworthy, <laughs> humble, and uh, really appreciate it. Um, because you know this is the 30th year of the Turtles. I've had a lot of work. So it's kind of cool that uh, today, um, well, not only is it the 30th anniversary of the Turtles, the Turtles were originally created in Dover, New Hampshire in 1983. Peter and I did the first sketches together and then worked on the original comic book. But in May of 1984 is when the first Turtle comic came out. So May of this year is going to be officially 30 years. Um, What's super cool about today, amongst everything else I get to share with you guys, is I did a voice for the new uh, Turtles animated show. I <laughs> um, tell you, so, but it's funny because it premiered today at 11 o'clock this morning. I pulled a few strings. I did it just for you guys. So, no, that was that was actually pretty cool. But I played this um, uh, my good friend uh, Ciro Neely, who's the. Uh, um, it's funny. He's uh, he's the executive producer of the show. And what's so cool about Ciro is his dad owned a pizza parlor when he was growing up in Philadelphia. He loved turtles, he loved comics, he loved uh, reading and dragging his mom to all the movie, all the turtle movies and made her buy all those turtles things. And here he is all this time later, now he's an executive producer on the show and what's even cooler is he's sort of picking out his favorite things out of 30 years of turtles and putting them into the show. So you're gonna see a lot of new characters, a lot of characters he created, but a lot of homage to um, original characters that he's created. Um, he, he loved in the original series, the original black and white series, the uh, animated series, some of the movies. So if you haven't seen the show, I think it's fantastic. I really love it. And so he started asking me about a year or so ago, because I go in and I work with the guys on the show, and he asked me to do a voice. And I said, if I do a voice on the show, I want it to be kind of like what George Clooney did on South Park. I want it to be like a dog or something crazy. <laughs> and so, so my wife and I, this is Courtney over here, part of Team Eastman. Um, my wife Courtney and I were at San Diego Comic Con last year, and he was showing, flipping through the slideshow of some of the new characters that they're developing, and he showed this cat, which was his homage to the Michelangelo Christmas story, where Peter and I introduced a cat named Clunk, and so he wanted to include a cat in the series, and so Michelangelo gets this, April finds a cat, gives it to Michelangelo, and the cat accidentally eats some ice cream with some mutagen in it, and he becomes ice cream, cream kitty. <laughs> So I stood up in the middle of Comic Con and said, that's it, that's what I want to be, Ice Cream Kitty. And they thought I was kidding, so <laughs> we kept bugging them for about six months and said, dude, you do not give Ice Cream Kitty to anybody else who want to be Ice Cream Kitty. So we went up a couple weeks ago and recorded The Voice in the show premiere today, so it's, it's super awesome. So. <laughs> well, I'd say it's funny then, since uh, you know, Peter and I did the first drawings of the Turtles and we didn't think we'd sell one single copy of issue one, um, again, your fault for buying them, thank you. Um, we never even thought of doing a second issue when we started back in Dover, New Hampshire back in 1983 and 84 and 85. And then when we started working on the, uh, you know, the success, well, the success of the comics, then we started working on the uh, animated series and the toys. And I have to tell you, I don't think, even while we were doing it, we wanted, to, you know, Peter and I had full control over our characters because we created them, we wrote them, we owned them. And we weren't gonna let anybody do anything with our characters that we didn't want to see that with them. So when we worked on the uh, animated show, um, it was really fun because the original black and white series was done for a much older audience. It was edgier, a little bit grittier, and you know the way we wanted to see comic books. And so when we started working on the animated series, we specifically were writing it for a younger audience. So we were able to include more, more humor in the series. Uh, we were able to do things like, Peter had the idea to have each of the turtles have a different color bandana, which was a really cool thing. Makes them, the individual personalities stand out even more. Um, but when we worked on the first five episodes, we <laughs> never, these are never gonna make it on the air. This is just too bizarre. You look at all the cartoons that were out there. And when the first cartoon show aired in 1987, Christmas break of 87, the ratings were huge. Um, your fault. And um, <laughs> thank you. And uh, we started working on the rest of the series. So it was kind of fun to develop this whole line of um, our characters for, for a younger audience and kids, and that was a blast. Um, and when we, my favorite part is, so we, the show comes out in 1987, and the toys came out in um, June of 1988. And I remember quite clearly, it's my favorite story, is 
back when KB Toy Stores was the toy store. So Pete and I, we lived in, um, we moved back to uh, Massachusetts at this time. So we go to the local KB store down in Springfield. As we're kind of walking down the aisle where the action figures are, this mom is dragging her little son <laughs> out of the action figure aisle and said, no, I'm not buying you one of those stupid Ninja Turtles. Um, <laughs> and we were like, oh my God, what have we done? Um, and then, uh, you know, man, the toys sold out. It was, it's funny because Peter and I used to do a lot of signings together and the signings were really a little bit different than they are today because the signings we did in the old days, there would typically be a, a, a young fan and an incredibly ticked off parent behind them with this look on his face like, or her face going, do you know how many turtle blimps I bought trying to put together Christmas Eve? And do you remember how many sewer play sets I had to buy and how much I've shelled out for those turtles? And so we thank them profusely again. Um, but it's, um, so that was kind of cool. And again, you know, this is going back now 25 years. And what's so cool about today is, angry man. No, um, <laughs> it wasn't me, it was him. No, um, and so today it's really cool because now uh, turtles are officially 30 years old. So a lot of young persons that were fans of the turtles originally have grown up and they have kids and families of their own. So the shows are like, you know, a mom or dad and a dad and a son or daughter coming to the show. And now they're both fans of the turtles. So it's kind of generational. That's really even more flattering. I mean, you know, if you'd have told me, and actually told my parents I was going to move out of the basement when I was growing up drawing cartoons all the time, to still be here talking about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 30 years later, it's just, um, like I said, it's humbling and it's, um, it's fantastic. I'm super, super, super appreciative. Um, this is a really, I started saying this is the 30th anniversary of uh, the Turtles, so it's been really fun that, um, you know, three or four years ago I started working on the new Turtle movie. Um, actually, this August would be three years I started working on the IDW comic series. I don't know if you guys Ooh, see yeah. the IDW series. <laughs> you know, that was um, also cool because when we started working on the IDW series, I hadn't been fully engaged in the Turtles um, as of, you know, writing and drawing since Peter and I used to do it. Um, I think the last Turtle comic book I did was with uh, Simon Bisley in 1996. It was a crazy, over-the-top violent story, um, Body Come. And um, so to me, it was like when I met with Tom Walsh, who really deserved the, all the credit, much like Ciro did with the new animated series. Ciro picked all of his favorite parts of the tur you know, Turtles' 25-year history. Tom grew up as a fan of the Turtles, and he picked his favorite parts of the Black and White series and the animated series and stuff. It sort of re created this new Turtles universe where we could kind of pick and choose different characters and different stories they wanted to tell. And again, he, so the IDW called me up, my old friend Ted owns IDW, and he said, do you want to come down and see what we're doing for the new Turtle comic series? Maybe you can do a few covers. And it was amazing because when they started laying out what they wanted to do for a storyline, I got like really, really, really excited. Um, and, uh, you know, I love the turtles. I've always loved the turtles. The turtles have been such a huge part of my life. You guys are giving me the best job in the entire universe. And so when they said, this is what we want to do in the new series, I actually realized, one, how much I love them and how much I miss them and how much I couldn't wait to start drawing them again. And so I worked on, now it is, I've done 35 covers. Um, I did a Turtles annual last year that came out, which was a 60 page story. And out of the entire history of the turtles, I've never done a story that big and that long all by myself, and so that was fantastic to do that. And you know, much like with the new cartoon series, when IDW launched the new comic series, you guys came out and started buying the stuff again. So again, you've given me a great job, and, a, and um, I'm really enjoying it. I'm actually working on a new um, Turtles annual now, which um, Bobby, the lead editor at IDW, is gonna kill me because it's gonna be about a month late. Um, <laughs> I'm just slow. <laughs> You've seen the lines. I mean, my God, I was like, I was like, <laughs> I do these sketches, and I love it. It touched me. It's like if I could draw all day, and I often do. Um, I love it, and, and try to get to each and every one of you. And I want to make sure that you know we don't let anybody leave without a signature or a chance to say hi or a picture and that stuff. But we'll we'll work hard. But we've got a seven-year-old waiting for us, so we're gonna have to shoot out of here tonight. Um, so another big thing that's happening in. Um, the 30th anniversary of the Turtles, 2014, is we have a new movie coming out. Yeah. <laughs> and I know that uh, you've read a lot of stuff in the trades and the press, and it's like, oh my god, babe, what a jerk. Well, um, <laughs> and, 
and uh, I just want to make sure that I've been I've had a chance to get out and, and share my experience on the series because I started working with the original series producers um, three years ago in the movie and when Michael Bay and Jonathan Liebsman came in the story that they wanted to tell the writers that they wanted to tell they really um, were very concerned about messing with the franchise and messing with what we grew up with the turtles I mean that's you know to me the best superhero movie I've ever seen is is the Avengers I mean you know Joss Whedon you know you know, was, the movie was so perfect, I practically wept. I mean, that was the stuff that I was reading when I was a kid. And so we know what it's like if somebody comes in, especially if Hollywood comes in and messes with the characters that we've grown up our whole lives with and that we love um, and want to continue to love and not hate Michael Bay. And, um, but I've seen the script, uh, I've seen the character designs. Um, I have a cameo in the film. Yeah. I can't tell you what it is. I'm doing my Stanley thing. No, but I have, a, I have an awesome cameo. You know? um, and it's coming out, I think, August 8th is the latest date, but I think you're gonna be really happy. I think you're gonna be, um, you know. Where's the trailer? <laughs> so back here, oh, the movie trailer, sorry. No, the, uh, actually, I was surprised. I thought they were gonna have it out by now, but I think that they're, you know. I think it's gonna premiere with Captain America. That's what I heard. Oh, no kidding, that's Winter Soldier. When's that, March? Uh, April. April. April, that's too long. <laughs> that's way too long. <laughs> um, so yeah, the movie is it's it's gonna be, you know, a lot of things exploding. <laughs> no, it's it's gonna be good. I think you'll be really happy with it and uh, it's it's gonna be a whole lot of fun. Um, so let me see. Um, why don't we do some questions? Now we actually had a we prepared a whole slideshow and stuff like that, but we came unprepared. We didn't bring the rest of the stuff with us. But um, you know, I can kinda of switch ball and do this stuff. But um I sort of give you some origins, what's going on this year and uh, What's coming up later this year? So, if you guys have specific questions on the turtles, why don't you start wherever? This, you got a hand up first? Uh, yeah. Will there ever be another tabletop RPG? Yeah. Man, you know, I hope so. Because that was, um, you know, that was, it's funny because the, the tabletop RPG, that was one of the first things that Peter and I licensed back in the day. Palladium Books did an awesome job. Um, <laughs> back in the days when Peter and I still had time to still do drawings and work on the concept and stuff like that, we loved it. So, you know, it's it's tough because I know that um, you know, it's it's uh, it's one of those I call it an art form, which, which I think is is back stronger than it's ever been. So I think if we can get that on Nickelodeon's radar, then hopefully they'll do something because I think it'd be a lot of fun. So, thanks. In the corner there. First of all, thank you for creating my childhood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very kind. Thank you very much. Uh, just Thank you. <laughs> and um, I did have a question for you is the pizza. Where does <laughs> yeah. the pizza come from? I, in high school, I worked in a pizza place, and I still eat a lot of pizza. You may have <laughs> 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 need to find a gym again. No, um, but no, I, all through high school, I worked at a, at a pizza place in Westbrook, Maine, uh, where I grew up, and it, it was one of those things I love pizza. And it's like when you start with a concept that's as silly as Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, even. You know, when we came up the names for um, the characters themselves, um, you know, we we said, well, this idea is so crazy and so goofy. Um, you know, we could have traditional Asian names, um, but that didn't seem to be funny enough. And we could have traditional American names, and that didn't seem funny enough. And I grew up as a as a huge art history fan. In fact, the the last um, my graduating year in high school, um, 1980, class of 80, uh -huh. and uh, we uh, go go Blazers. No, we did. Um, I did this huge mural in my high school of uh, my homage to Leonardo da Vinci. And so I just threw this out to Pete when we were sitting bantering in our little Mirage Studios. And the name Mirage Studios came from, we didn't actually have a studio, it was our living room, so it was a Mirage. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I said, you know, names like blah, 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 well, how about Leonardo da Vinci? Leonardo, Michelangelo. And um, actually, funny is that Donatello was almost named Bernini because Bernini was my favorite sculptor from that time period. And Peter was like, no, let's let's do one that ends in an O. And so Donatello, who was also awesome as a sculptor. So. But um, no, so it's uh, it's fantastic. And I forgot the rest of your question. Was there something that you asked? And then I, I tend to drift sometimes, but. The pizza. Oh, and the pizza. Yeah. <laughs> so we, and we eat a lot of pizza. So. <laughs> Actually, the best job I had at that time um, when we were working on the first issue of the Turtles is I worked night shift at a, at a local hotel. So it's like, I basically check in a few people um, late at night, then I have the whole night to draw. 
and that was awesome. And now I draw for a living, so it's even more awesome. So, uh, gentleman right there, Dana. Oh, he was fantastic. Thanks for bringing that up. He was, um, it would be sadly missed. I mean, we worked with a, interestingly enough, I hadn't seen him in a number of years since the original series. And um, some friends of mine from Canada are making this incredibly awesome turtle history documentary. I really think it's a, I saw a cut of it. Um, they've been working on it for about five years. And it's one of those documentaries that's not full of, you know, fluff and, you know, selling something. It's like they actually go in and made it for fans. They're fans themselves, they made it for fans. And one of the things that they did um, when they were in California is the house I lived in, we got to get all the original voice talent, including James Avery, Rob Paulson, and so many other people, got to come over the house and so we hang out for half a day and, you know, just do, do Shredder, and do Shredder asking for a pretzel, you know? Like, <laughs> but uh, but uh, no, he was fantastic and he was a real, he was a real gentleman and he'd be he'd greatly miss. Thanks for bringing that up. Young lady? <laughs> you know, it's like I think Cyril's getting enough pressure that um, they're gonna put Cowabunga back in the series. Um, just as just they have to. It's like you know, but it was sort of like you know when Cyril took his first pass on developing the characters. Even you know, if you notice the design of the characters, if you looked at the original covers of like Turtles number one, they have the kind of the wider legs and you know skinnier bodies. I kind of end up drawing them more muscular later on. Um, but so he, he sort of hit the reset button and went back to the original, some of the original concept designs. And um, Kawabunga didn't come until the animated series, and so it wasn't really in the original comic series. So when Ciro started working on it, he goes, and he was a big fan of um, Ali G, um, Sasha Baron Cohen, I guess he did an Ali G, and he used to say that. So that was one of Ciro's own things, and I think it's pretty cool, but you know, a lot of fans said, bring back Kawabunga. So, and you'll see it back. So. Um, you, please. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. I have two and... We'll I get have, to everybody. Okay, I have two. One is like, since it's been, your idea has been interpreted by so many different people, is there one you favor the most that's been done by someone else? That's a, that's a tough question and a good one. She asked if um, there's been so many versions of the turtles, do I have one that's my favorite? Um, and a couple things, I guess, when Peter and I grew up reading comic books, one of the things that we were used to seeing was lots of different art teams working on some of our favorite characters. Some we liked, you know, back in those days, some we liked less, some we liked more. And so it was a very normal thing when we started doing the comic books that we would have um, different artists coming in and, and working on the Turtle comics, especially when we were developing the animated show and, and uh, working on the toys, we got less and less time to keep a regular schedule. And to us, it was always interesting that what different artists that we admired and, and, and respected, ideas that they saw in our character that we never saw, so they'd say like, Oh, I love how you did this in the series and that in the series, and they're reading more into it than like we did. Oh, that was no, but they did have their own sort of take on on, on our characters, which was pretty pretty um, flattering and fascinating. Um, but out of all the series, I mean, it was great to work with the writers that we worked on on the animated series, the comic series, and then when we get to the movies, um, hands down, I guess I would say if I had to point to one favorite version of the turtles, it'd be the first turtle movie because um, it, uh, uh, it was great. We actually. Um, yeah, it was fantastic. And we're actually trying to get a, a director's cut of that um, out there sometime this year. Because Steve Barron, um, who worked on this original Turtle movie, he, you know, you have Hollywood producers coming in and say, "Oh, we want to turn them into nuns or something." You know, they want to do this and we want to do that. And, and Steve Barron came in and he had bought one of the original 500-page um, um, black and white collections of all the original series stories that um, Peter Laird and I did, and he had gone through and postmarked his favorite scenes and his favorite plot lines out of that story and that's what then became the first movie um, and then you know if that wasn't cool enough he brought Todd Langdon in to write the script and the coolest 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 part was getting to work with Jim Henson who did the did the costumes and that was that was really you know, seriously um, it was it was fantastic because it, if the turtles didn't work on the big screen then the whole thing wouldn't have worked and I remember we, when Peter and I were developing, you know, the look for the movie, Jim Henson's Creature Shop was in London, so we would get, you know, FedExes and pictures, and they would send us stuff of everything they looked and some tests, but it wasn't until we went on the movie set um, in 1989, and uh, I still remember Pete and I sort of walking from the front office down in Wilmington, North Carolina, where they, where they filmed it, um, to the back lot, and you kind of, you know, if you've ever seen a Hollywood set, you know, it's all like staging in the back, and then, you know, the facades are in the front, so, you come around this corner, and all of a sudden you have New York City, 
you know, brightest day. I mean, at night, it was shot at night. Um, there was New York City in all its glory with all the lights and standing over in the corner were all four Ninja Turtles like stretching and one had a sombrero on, was dancing and that stuff, we just froze and it was just, they had really come to life and that was, that was, I was mind blowing. I still remember it like, you know, yesterday, so. And also, uh, since there's a new turtle show, will there be another Turtles Forever? Um, special? Um, the, Turtles Forever. That was one of my favorite, <laughs> my favorite ideas that they'd done in a while, and that was when uh, Peter and uh, the guys who worked on the last um, uh, Fox Kids series, and I think they were getting ready to transition to um, Nickelodeon, and they came up with the idea to sort of combine all three universes, including the original black and white series, and they told me about it. Um, they said, do you want to do a voice at the end like Peter and I did, which was awesome, and they said, this is what the story's going to be, and like, Dude, that's either going to be the most fantastic ever, or it's just going to totally not be any good. And it was fantastic. It was really, you know, I thought they, I thought they did a great job. Um, it was really fun to be part of that. So, thanks. Thanks. Uh, Casey. Uh, Casey. Where did the character Casey Jones come from? <laughs> great, great, great question. Um, Casey Jones was uh, um, an idea that I had. Um, we've done, I think, the first three issues, and we've been working on the fourth issue. And around that time in comic books, they had a very popular um, theme, which is these four-issue micro-series. And um, I said, Pete, we need to do, as we're doing Turtles, it has to be a one-issue micro-series, <laughs> just one issue. And each issue would feature a different turtle, so you could get into their personality a little bit more. Um, uh, again, we were still, we'd only done like three issues at that time. And a big po another popular theme in comics at that time was um, vigilantes, they, like, and, you know, Batman, it, is more or less a vigilante, but each vigilante in comics had a really horrific um, story that tells how they got to be vigilantes. You know, my old family was murdered, my city was murdered, and, you're, you're, and so on. You know, and, uh, and I wanted to have a character that became a vigilante because he watched too much bad TV. <laughs> so, and Pete used to watch, um, and I used to tease him relentlessly, um, Pete used to watch T.J. Hooker, uh, The A-Team, um, all these shows that I was like, <laughs> and, uh, and so I had Casey watching three TVs at once, um, and he put together his own costume, which was stuff that he had in the closet. He was a hockey player, so he had the mask and all that stuff. So I just had two bats, and I designed this basic rough sketch of it, and Pete goes, you know what the character really needs? It's a golf bag, and like with all kinds of different weapons in there. So I'm like, that's it, and that became Casey. Um, and so we did that first issue. We wanted Casey to be crazier than Raphael, so that Raphael sort of, that's what the story is called, me, myself, and I, is um, for Raphael for the first time to see someone even crazier than he is, and it sort of puts him in check a little bit. Um, and that was the first thing we did with Casey, and then um, a couple years later, I saw uh, one of my favorite John Carpenter movies, which is uh, Big Trouble in Little China. And Kurt Russell's character in Big Trouble in China, that was like, that's my Casey Jones. <laughs> and so every, every time I've written Casey ever since then, it's always been with Jack Burton in mind. You know, what would Jack Burton do? Um, is my thanks to John Carpenter, so uh, thanks. Uh, let's go somebody, you'll be good. What was it like seeing your characters dance with vanilla eyes? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> <Not leaving. laughs> no, uh, um, you know, it's funny is that um, when we did the first movie, um, one of the, around the time they were putting together the soundtrack for the first movie, they got found a lot of really amazing um, recording artists to be on it, including MC Hammer before Can't Touch This. And, and um, Partners in Crime did that great Turtles rap song and all that stuff, and that was great. You know, we're talking, my goodness, 20 some odd years now. Um, and so we love the soundtrack, it fit the movie. Uh, Steve Barron, uh, you know, was most famous for even before he did the first Turtle movie, he did, you know, Michael Jackson's Billie Jean video and the Dire Straits Money for Nothing video and the Aha uh -huh video with the Take On Me and he had this great visual sense, great sense of music. And so when they started working on the second movie, it was sort of like the director and the people that produced the movie did two things, in my opinion, in our opinion, I should say, my opinion anyway, is that they decided that the turtles had to be less serious like they were in the first movie and make it more of like a live action cartoon. That's why you never saw them really use their weapons that much. What's that? They didn't say damn anymore. No. So I would say they made it sillier and uh, they just basically said, we're putting together the soundtrack right now, let's pick out the biggest name. And he was really popular at that, at that time. And if you read the script and saw the movie, you'd be like what we kind of were initially, which was what happened. 
And then that whole scene with um, Vanilla Ice wasn't my favorite scene. But it's nothing against Mr. Is it Van Winkle, Rob Van Winkle? Um, I'm, I'm sure he's a great person and, and, uh, and fine, and, and um, yeah, but yeah, just not my cup of tea. <laughs> At five, it was awesome. At five, it was awesome. But you know, so we also did the Turtles live tour, which was like, oh my goodness, that was crazy. Out of our shell tour, which was a great idea. <laughs> I still remember going to radio, first time I go to radio to the music hall is to see the Turtles, Turtles Live. So I think they were still had the shells on at that time. It was the first opening night and they had actual turtles passing out left and right because of the costume cut <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yes, back over here and then we'll go to you. That's okay. I wanted to know what, because he died in the first issue. Yes. I wanted to know what did you guys bring him back and what was the the comic series, right? Well, that was you know it's 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 funny and it's tough to do. Um, you know, when Pete and I did the first um, the first issue, we said that you know we're not going to be one of those you know typical comic book you know <laughs> characters that always brings back the same bad guy again and again. Um, so we did that. <laughs> no, so no, we stayed we stayed away for. Um, you know, we get we did um, you know we were we never thought there'd be a second issue. We never thought you guys would buy the first issue, and we came up with the idea for um, Turtles Two. You know, we added Baxter Stockman and the Evil Scientists and the Mausers. Um, we added April O'Neil, and then we um, started developing more of the Turtles backstory because a lot of you know that read comic books. Um, a lot of the Turtles' origin is based on Daredevil's origin. You know, you know that was my favorite part of Daredevil is that when in the comic series when young Matt Murdock got hit in the head with a canister that made him blind and made him daredevil, they never said what happened to the canister. So that's, Pete and I took that and had to continue bouncing down the street and smash this this uh, bowl of turtles. This kid just happened to be standing right over a sewer drain with a world of contents convenient. You know. um, so um, we then took them deeper into origin. We wanted to go out of space because Pete and I were both big, huge Star Wars fans. So at the end of Turtles 3, 4, 5, 6, and wrapping up at 7, we took them to outer space. When it came back, you know, we sort of hear a shredder in the background going, bring me back, bring me back. And it was just, he was too cool of a character not to do something with it. So we came up with a, a plot line that brought him back um, in Turtles, uh, starting Leonardo, because um, uh, we did the Cerebus Turtle crossover in issue 8, then we started Leonardo 9, 10, uh, I, which in the 10 and 11, actually the main ones, um, to bring him back. And then paid the whole thing off in City of War, which Pete had this crazy idea to, <laughs> he, re he reads too much, but he had this, he saw this thing where they had these certain grub worms that would eat part of a, a, an animal and become um, similar to and take on the, the, the habits and the styles and the first line of this animal. So the, the foot guy shred, fed the rest of what was left of the shredder to these worms and recreated a worm shredder. So that was the thing we did in Return to New York. And then we killed him again, and I was like, that was it. And then along comes the cartoon series, and now shredder everywhere. <laughs> but he's too fun to write. And you know, the, the animated series um, got a little tedious for us because we kept trying to push new characters, new bad guys into the into the, an the animation series. It just got to be so formulaic where they would you know, Shredder would be like, there are a few guys, and then he up and said he would mess something up. He is, oh, actually, I pointed you first, so I'll get you next. Yep. Uh, can you hear your ice cream pity voice? <laughs> <laughs> it was, I had to go through this whole method process. Um, Nickelodeon required it, so I had to live with cats for about two weeks on the street. <laughs> and uh, practice my meows, and it was, like, it was like, it was one of those things that was, so it's a lot of hissing and, a lot of sound effects, but it is, it's just basically, it's a cat. <laughs> we did do some purring and some <laughs> and we, were, we were joking, because um, I want to, we got to try to get it made in time for the show, but I want to have a t-shirt that says, I am Ice Cream Kitty, just so, and my wife was going to get one that says, I'm with Ice Cream Kitty. <laughs> Maybe next time you see us out there, we'll have, have something there, so. Um, you have one right there. Yes, sir. Yeah, what inspired you to write Melty Pot? Say that again? Melty Pot. Melty Pot? Yeah, what inspired you to write that? What inspired me to do the series? Yeah. Oh, well, it was, um, I did this other a series called Melting Pot, and it was, um, 
it was funny, it was around the same time I was working, it's a very edgy sci-fi story um, that um, I basically wanted to set up a premise that started bad, got worse, and then horribly, and and that's what I designed the series on. So it was a lot of these, um, it went back to my roots in heavy metal. I was very inspired in 1977 when I first bought heavy metal and getting, getting to see all these European artists that were doing, you know, Jodorowsky and Mobius and Belial, people that were doing these fantastic um, science fiction based stories. So that was kind of my melting pot was my homage to heavy metal, sort of gritty sci-fi, edgy stuff. But what was funny was at the same time I was working on this other kids project that I developed called Underwear, which is uh, W-H-E-R-E, -E, um, and it's this very lighthearted sort of Calvin and Hobbes meets Wizard of Oz. So it was sort of like spending days designing melt, you know, melting pot with like, ah, anger, violence, and then, you know, underwear, nice. Um, so it's, you know, I guess I'm a Gemini, so I can handle both personalities. So. But it was a fun series, and thanks, good question. Yes, sir? It was a uh, Frank Miller's. Uh, well, was more importantly, it was uh, Frank Miller's Daredevil. But <laughs> uh, two things um, kind of coincided. Well, actually, it was like a perfect storm for Peter and I because we both grew up reading comics, being hugely inspired by Jack Kirby, Wally Wood, and, and so many artists at the time. It's always both with Peter. Both Peter and I like to say we we kind of stand on the shoulders of giants that inspired us to draw. And then um, there was this real big self publishing movement around that time in the late seventies uh, into early eighties. Guys like Dave Sim started with Cerebus, and what I loved about Cerebus when I found it in my little comic store was, um, here's this little art bar drawn like Barry, Sm Barry Smith uh, was drawing Conan, running around and you know, hacking people up and doing all this crazy stuff, And um, but it you know, went on 300 issues and became this fantastic series, but with Cerebus, uh, it got a lot of notice because, hey, look at this funny animal comic. Um, so Peter and I were fans of comics, we were fans of you know X-Men, New Mutants, um, Frank Miller had come out with Ronin at that time. Um, there were so many exciting things going on in comics, and I was a fan of Daredevil before Frank Miller came along. I still remember, remember when Frank Miller came in and he joined the series and blew us all away for 30 issues. So when we sort of had Jack Kirby influence, who Commandy was my favorite story, which was all animal characters. Yes, and uh, we had uh, Dave Sim doing Cerebus, um, uh, New Mutants. So when we did. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, we just sort of put the best and our favorite bits of all comics and rolled it into one. And then the parody element was kind of like what Dave Sim, Sim did with Cerebus, is we just said, let's make the first issue serious but silly, and, and nobody's gonna buy it anyway. So. <laughs> so we just had fun with it. So it was parodying our favorite things in comics, so. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, why didn't you make Leonardo the waiter? Why did we? Yeah. Well. <laughs> It was sort of, when we started designing the, um, the turtle characters, um, we sort of based um, a lot of their personality on the weapons. And so where to us the katana and, and the swords was sort of a traditional samurai, more you know, very respectful, you know, um, serious warrior um, character. They just seemed to be natural for the leader. Um, so Leonardo sort of was all based around the katanas. And Raphael, for example, his size are for main for close in fighting and you know more you know nastier fighting I guess and so with Raphael being sort of um, you know the our berserker a Wolverine character if you will so that's perfect for him nunchucks you ever use nunchucks man I hit myself so many times it just seemed like somebody that was going to do something like that um, might be a little sillier but master him so it fit Michelangelo and then Donatello was our kind of techno um, more sort of um, referee with the other brothers, so uh, this bow staff is sort of a monk's traditional weapon, um, and you know, even though sometimes guys with a staff can be guys with swords, but it still, um, it seemed to fit Donatello's personality, so. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, good question. Way in the back over there, you put up there a few times there. Thank you. Uh, the conception for the new movie coming out, is that still from your own image, or did they choose something from another line? I'm sorry, repeat that again? I'm, I'm a little deaf in my old age. The conception for the new movie coming out. Yes. Is that still from your image, or is it from what they predetermined? No, it's, it's, what they did is, um, when they were designing the story, is that they wanted to pick some of their favorite parts of the original series, the original movies, and some of the animated stuff, but still um, make it its own thing. But they, 
they fully realize um, uh, how they need to make sure it stays true to the original series and inspired by the original series. So I think and hope a lot of fans will be surprised when it finally comes out that it'll be, it'll be good and a lot of action and, and they won't be disappointed. Um, anybody else? I don't know how much time we have left. We, another, oh, another two hours. We have another two hours, so we have some good questions and long ones. A yes. couple more. <laughs> Young lady, I'll we'll go to you. Thank you. Um, my question is, with turtles now being 30 years old, what do you think it is about the turtles that made it so popular? <coughs> you guys. <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, <coughs> you know, what's interesting is that you know you break you know the story uh, turtles concept down to its its basic elements is you have um, a family and a sort of a misfit family. And I don't care if it's you know the way I grew up in the schoolyard or any job that I ever had. It's like that becomes your family, and you sort of you have the funny one and the serious one and whatever, and so you have this, this interesting bond. Um, and I think that because, you know, they weren't one specific, you know, uh, white, black, um, Asian, they weren't, you know, they were mutants. So I think a lot more people could kind of identify them because I think every kid out there, especially growing up, feels a little bit like they're a misfit. Um, and they want to just find their place to fit in. And then at the same time, it was to me, it was um, all of us want to be the, um, the hero that saves the day, that does the right thing, that makes the right decision, and that's Turtle's main objective was always to be teenagers first, and you know, eat pizza, and just hang, you know, do this. But they, when things got serious, they were able to protect themselves and protect their brothers and protect their family. And I think that's all we secretly desire to do that. And it's, you know, sort of I think just a lot of people could identify them to them, and um, you know, because we really thought about it, and it's sort of, you know, over now it's been thirty years, and um, every time we've done, you know, a new. Um, movie or a new cartoon series, um, the only thing that's gonna make any of those things work and be even remotely a success is uh, if you guys come out and see it and you choose to, 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 to buy it or be part of it. And so it's, I turn the blame on you and thank you at the same time. So it's, hopefully we're doing a good job because you guys have given me an awesome job. So, um, actually him first that I'll go in the back. You, yes, sir. So going along with the idea of the Mutant Ninja Turtles in space and all that, where did this come from? You know, I'll mention it right now. Like, what did you about it, the collaboration between Power Rangers, Walk Space, really, really. <laughs> <laughs> I was nuts. I was crazy. I mean, it, it was one of those, you know, it's one of those things that, um, uh, the original idea, um, because, you know, I remember, you know, in 1977 going to the theater five times to see Star Wars, and, you know, that, that affected me, like, maybe, you know, I just loved it. And Peter was a huge Star Wars fan, so when we had the chance to, we were looking for the next story arc in the early days of the Turtles. Um, we said, well, what can we do with them now? And we said, well, let's take them into space. Let's do our, our love poem to George Lucas. And so we did that. And then, you know, as, as things went on, you know, by the time we did the, something like the Power Rangers thing, which was more Haim Saban and what they were doing with the live action Turtle series, we'd already done 300 cartoon shows. I mean, it's like, you're like man, what's left? You know, so you keep trying to look for interesting ideas and ways to reach your audience and stuff like that. And that was probably a bit sillier than we would have liked, but, you know, the Power Rangers are still, you know, I did a show this past weekend and, you know, there was many Power Rangers fans there as there were Turtle fans. It's crazy. It still, you know, resonates with, with fans. So it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> Thanks. Good. Yes, sir, in the back. What's your, of everything you've created, what is your favorite creation? Of oh. series and character. Series of character? Um, I would probably have to go back to um, series, I mean, series of character, I'd have to go back to Raphael, uh, the Raphael one shot, um, only because I loved uh, Casey. And, and, you know, even I've, I love all the turtles, I love all the stories that Peter and I did together, I love all the turtle stories that we've, I've worked on with different artists. Um, when I'm doing stuff on my own, um, I, you know, fans notice a lot of the short stories and even some of the long stories I do feature. Um, Casey and Raphael as characters because they're they're really fun to write because they're kind of really goofy and and it is like they're like brothers like um, you know like, like Bob and Doug McKenzie and Strange Brew you know they torture each other but they love each other um, and because they're so different unique and you know with Raphael being a little unpredictable you can take the stories places that you couldn't take you know Leonardo wouldn't go along with some of the stuff or Donatello wouldn't or Michelangelo wouldn't so I I feel like there's a more open palette to write a more interesting 
story for me and hopefully to you. But um, you know, so I'd say Raphael is my favorite single issue. Um, although Turtles number eight with Cerebus was was a big, a big uh, favorite of mine. And then the first Turtle movie was first. <laughs> so, uh, who hasn't asked a question yet? Anyway, one more question. A green shirt right there. Say that again. Did you work with Stan Sakai on the turtle? Oh my God! Thanks for mentioning Stan um, because he is the um, one of the nicest, one of the coolest, one of the most talented um, creators and artists that I've ever met. Um, and you know, you should mention that Yosago Jimbo was like we were out there doing shows together. You know, Peter and, and Stan and I we were always sitting in Artist Alley doing sketches for five dollars so we could run around and buy comics after the show and and stuff. And um, uh, Stan's going through a bit of a tough time with his wife right now, so it was all. Say a prayer, keep our thoughts, stand on our thoughts. But um, um, I love Yusagi Ojimbo. It was, it was a natural. So when we, you know, got a chance to include him in not only the uh, original Turtle animated series and uh, Turtles comics, and then the animated series, and, and hopefully we can get him back into the new series. Because I know I was talking to Ciro two weeks ago about other characters that I wanted to see, and, and um, Yusagi Ojimbo was on top of his list to try to get try to get involved in the new series. I wanted Flaming Carrot too, but I love Flaming Carrot. <laughs> Goofy is. I love that turtle series. So, um, so I think are we all set. So, thanks you guys. I want to tell you uh, again. I cannot thank you. Um, thank you again very much for coming out. Um, think, making me feel so uh, incredibly welcome and, and having such a great time here in Sacramento. And hopefully we'll see you again soon. But I'm gonna use the restroom and I'll be back. I'll wash my hands, don't worry. Use the restroom and then um, I'll see you back at the table for anybody that wants a signature or okay. signature. So. Thanks again.